So welcome. What I want us to do is talk just to, for a moment. We have a table set up back there. It's called Greater, which is a new series we're starting next week. It's going to be a four-week series. And Stephen Furtick, who's a pastor in uh, North Carolina of Elevation Church, put this curriculum together. It comes with a book, a DVD, and a, and a group study guide. And so we have a list of groups that you could join if you like, and they're, they're listed there. But the, quickly, on Monday nights, uh, Aline will be meeting at 630 at our Four Echoes store in Seekonk. Tuesday night, uh, Jimmy and Wilma, who are, live in Cumberland, will be leading a group. Allison, who's in Barrington, will lead a group. Wednesday, Karen and Jess are in Rehoboth. Thursday, Chris and Chrissy uh, from East Providence. And Dawn Pratt will be doing one in the morning at 9 a.m. at the Coffee Depot in Warren. And then Sunday night, there's um, Cindy's going to be doing one in Barrington. And then we're actually going to have an online group for, for college students. So if... Um, I might not know that you have a student in college, so uh, if you do, let me know. Sign up on that sheet because I'll let Joe uh, get that contact information and be able to, um, you know, reach out and then get them involved that way. I, th I think that's a really neat endeavor that the kids that are all over the country can come together and, and study together, right? And this, this curriculum lends itself to having rich conversations. There's a reason why we're choosing this curriculum is because we want to take what's happening on Sunday mornings and then bring it maybe into your living room or at a coffee shop. It doesn't really matter where you do this, and it doesn't matter with how many people you do it with. What matters is that you engage in a conversation with somebody. All right? I really want you to hear that. I want you to engage in a conversation with somebody. So if you're in a group, fine. Sign up for a group, and that leader will get in touch with you. Um, however... If you want to do it with just one or two people on the side, I'm going to have on our website, it will it'll have a link for the DVD so you can watch that, and then it'll have a list of the questions. So you can just do this any way you want with whomever you want. But I think it's important that we learn how to engage in conversations. Okay? So if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, now, what I want you to do is think about this for a second. There's a verse in Hebrews 10. It says, let us hold unswervingly, you know what that means, right? So in life, we tend to get pulled back and forth. Unswervingly means we're going toward, straight at, this thing called hope. And it's a hope that we profess. I want you to get that. The hope that we profess, that we're going to go after it, because when life happens, hope can be kind of shaken and say, I'm not sure I have hope in the midst of what's going on in life. And then it continues, for he who promised is faithful. And that's the only reason why it can be unswerving, because it's in Jesus. And let us consider, okay, now this is for you today. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So this idea of when you leave here, that you're meeting in a group or you're meeting with someone around a coffee table. Can you spur one another on and live life to the fullest? See, so many times we let people just continue to go down a path that is destructive, and we don't stand in that gap. We just kind of let it happen on our watch. And what I'm hoping to do is get, get many of you spread out around all the different communities Engage in conversation that's real and authentic. That you'll truly be able to speak into someone else's life. And allow that person to speak into your life and have an exchange. Because we know we live in a broken world right now where there's so many different breakdowns with communication. There's breakdowns in relationships. We can't sit with someone that disagrees with us. Think about how sad that is. And in the church, we represent the whole. I want you to think about this for a second. I've been at a conference Friday, Saturday, today I'll be going back there, and then on Tuesday night. And one of the things that they asked us to consider was this idea of how do you view the world? Do you view the world through a lens of individuality, through self? Do you, do you see it through groups? Do you see it through community? Do you see it through the world? And what the premise is, 
is when I am concerned about a group, if you guys are truly concerned about each other, you'll be, you'll be in each other's lives. And you won't just let it continue to go as is. You'll be there for each other. You'll stand up for one another. You'll pray for one another. You'll encourage one another. You'll make sure that your marriages are rich. You'll make sure that your kids are being raised well. You will do what it takes because you care for one another. That's what it means when I have a lens through a group. If I have a lens through a church, then I notice when someone's not here. And right now, there's a lot of people not here. If they're not here, what's happening in their lives? I want you to consider that. Do you even consider the person who's not at your table right now? Do you consider that maybe they need a phone call? Maybe they need to know that someone cares about them, that someone missed them. Right? How many of you, when you don't go to church for a few weeks, you go, does anyone even notice that I'm not there? Does anyone even care? When I'm living a life through self in my own lens, I don't even see that. I'm here. I did my job, so I feel good about myself. That's the lens of individuality. I showed up. I did the right thing. Right? I can check it off. But when you see it through the lens of community, then you're ultimately very much concerned about the whole moving together as a community. Now take it, we're online, we're on live right now, Facebook Live, right? You have a societal view. Like we actually care about the people that aren't here that might be watching online. Whose lives might need hope. Whose lives might need the love of Christ and a message that will inspire them to get up and start living it out. And ultimately, when I start to see that I am we, like I am the world, and what's happening in the world is a reflection of what's happening in my life. It's a very, very powerful thought, because now I'm ultimately responsible to join you in your pain. So an example, obviously, would be anything that's happening in the world right now, right? All this devastation that we see around us, and we kind of turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to it because it's not happening to me right now, right? If I have a community or a societal view, if it's not happening in my society, I'm okay. We're not suffering in the flood or the earthquakes or the horrific uh, apartheid or whatever is happening in the world. If it's not happening in my society, I'm okay. And I will just continue as is. But when I make a connection when God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. When you connect yourself to that and you see yourself as a steward of God's goodness. All of a sudden, everything that happens in the world matters to you. And then all of a sudden there's a sense of, I have to do something about this. And when I wake up, now I'm motivated beyond just myself, just my family, just, just doing the things that everyone else is doing. Think about that. Because what ultimately has to happen inside of us to wake up and care? Here's what I had to do. I had to admit that I don't care. Think about that. If I am not doing anything about it, if you are not doing anything about it, can we really say with authenticity that we care? There's a huge disconnect. If I say, David, I know that you guys are struggling in your marriage, and I go, I go, God bless you. Thanks for coming to church. Have a great week. I'll pray for you, by the way, because I'm a really good Christian. But you guys go home, and you're still suffering. You're still not talking to each other. But I don't really give a rip because I'm on with my life. And I'm busy, David. But I really love you. Yeah, you feel the love. It's almost like, how do you feel, David? Their marriage is falling apart. And all of us are doing this. And I'm really busy. I got a lot going on. There's a disconnect. Remember last week I talked about that gap? 
I was standing way over there, and Jesus was over there, and he's still there. Jesus shows up very consistently. And, and look, at he has a child. <laughs> that gap. Did anyone close the gap this week? Think about it. Did anyone narrow the gap? It first starts with an awareness that I am responsible for the world. It's a very, very big statement. But don't you think that as a Christ follower, to the one that said God so loved the world, that what did he do? He gave his son. And he gave his son so that the world could have freedom. So that the world could understand compassion and forgiveness and hope. That's why. And then as his followers, we should be so charged up to see people the way that he sees people. That it breaks us. Because when you start to see people as if they're your sons and your daughters, that might cause us to stand up and do something. I was reminded of Maya Angelou, right? I, I've said this story before, but it was when she was on a movie set and Tupac was there and Tupac scrapping young man and in his 20s and he was with another guy and they were going at it. They started to almost get into a fisticuffs and they're arguing and swearing and yelling and this little black old woman, frail, comes into the situation and sticks herself inside of that situation between the two guys who are swearing at each other, about to punch each other in the face. And afterwards, Someone's, and she didn't know who they were. She didn't know who they were. They were just two men about to go at it. And they're a black man, and she's a black woman, and her people matter to her. You understand what I'm saying? Her people matter to her. And it broke her heart to see her people doing that. And someone asked her, how could you, as in your 70s, do something about that and risk your own safety. She's goes, because I saw them as my sons. And if I see someone as my son, I'm not going to allow them to hurt each other. When I see you as a daughter or a sister, then I might care enough to stand up and risk something. This idea of community. If there's people missing around your table and you know who they are, meaning they're your friends, the people that you're concerned about, people that you love and care about, make a phone call this week. Show up and have a cup of coffee. Find out how's life going. Because we need to do that. That's how transformation happens. I heard something the other day. It said, stop sharing, stop loving. No one ever falls out of love in a marriage. They just stop sharing. They stop sharing their lives with one another. You know what I mean? We didn't know we were going to do this, just so you know. And I'm not, I didn't know, but thank you. It's a gift. And now as a church, we go, oh, good job. Thanks for sharing. It touches our lives. But if we really care, and guess what? We're all in, imperfect. So if no one shows up at your doorstep, don't be surprised. My point, that's why there's a giant gap. And I can't show up at everyone's doorstep. Do you understand what I'm saying? I show up at a lot of people's doorsteps. I can't do it all. You understand what I'm saying? I need you. We need each other to change the world. And it happens one marriage at a time, one person at a time, one child at a time, one student, one colleague, one friend. Whose life will you step into? That's the value of authentic community that we talk about. Is it even the point of this message? But maybe it is. It says in that same verse, 
so if you don't mind, about holding unswervingly. Let us consider. In order to consider, we have to care. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Why do I want us sitting around tables? Why do I want us to take this and go out somewhere around a coffee table, around a dinner table? Because I know that all of us are hurting. There's not a giant gap for no reason. All of us are imperfect, all of us are broken, and all of us are in need of a Savior, in need of love from another human being. Now, in order to do that, sacrifice is necessary. Taking a risk, getting outside of your routine. So I encourage you, the tool, we talk about the church strategy as far as offering different things for people to, to uphold these values. That's why we're doing this new series. So that you can engage in new conversations. You can rediscover each other. Maybe you just do it the two of you. But now you have a tool or a resource to have spiritual conversations. Don't raise your hand, but how many of us just come to church, we hear the teaching, it was good or bad, you judge it, that's fine, doesn't really matter, right? But then if you don't do anything with it. So, again, this is what, don't raise your hand. But how many of you actually leave here and then engage with somebody about the conversation that we had here? If it's just a mental exercise, and then there's a judgment, it was good or bad, then what did it do to cause any kind of transformation? If it doesn't cause a transformation inside of me, then it can't cause transformation outside of us. And so I, this is a tool for us to engage in community at a deeper level with somebody. And for you that really are good risk takers, I would encourage you to think outside of the box, not just, quote unquote, the church people. How about someone from work, someone from your neighborhood? Because are we being authentic, uh, authentic when we profess that we're Christians, that we follow Christ, we love him, and it says to love God, to love your neighbor, but then I won't engage in a conversation about who he is in my life. And I'm not talking about trying to get someone, quote unquote, saved. I'm talking about engaging in real conversation. Because I believe that the scriptures are so rich and life transformative that if we will engage with people around the scriptures, it will change their life. They have the opportunity to meet Jesus Christ through a conversation, through a mutual exchange of love and respect. They don't need to agree with me. They don't need to be a believer in Jesus Christ. They just, I just need to engage in a conversation and be real and listen and love. So many of us have very, very limited opportunities to have conversations that are on a deeper level. If you, you know what I mean? Just think about your life right now and think about how often do you actually wrestle about some of the deep matters that are really important to God. And that's why I'm trying to expand our vision today about the world is you and you are the world. And how you go about that reflects the problems in this world. So when I hear that devastation that just happened in another country and I don't care about it, I don't even hear it, I don't see it, out of sight, out of mind, that's how I do it to you, Angela. You get it? If I do it out there, I do it in here. When Angela leaves, you all don't care. I don't care. You understand what I'm saying? But when we foster community, and we have that, I, that, that, um, that vision of that you matter to me, and, and it's mutual, then we can make a difference. Then we step into people's lives. And don't let ourselves get fooled by what society says is important because our society says, go and work, 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 work. Keep doing that until your marriage dies. Keep doing it while your best friend 
contemplating suicide. Keep doing it while this person's lighting up and getting addicted to drugs. Go ahead. You know, um, we have a woman in our apartment building, and she's going blind because of the eye problem. And uh, she fell in a tub one day. And of course, management helped her get up and everything. But now she had to give up her car because she can no longer drive. So the other day, she fell again. And somebody told me, so I went there. And I talked for a while, and she's got a, a black eye. And I feel terrible, so I said to her, can you still cook? And she says, it's very hard for me. So I figured maybe as a community, we'll do some cooking for her. And yeah. I'm not, the left hand isn't doing what the right hand do. Thank I'm not you. doing it. I'm not bragging. No. But this woman really, really needs our help. Thank you. You're welcome. Need that help. We're all in pockets together. That's beautiful. And uh, it'll bring me into what I'm just going to talk about. Because last week we talked about that. And I think that's what you're referring to with the left hand and the right hand. And I wanted you to understand when we talk about giving to the needy, prayer and fasting from last week, when it says, don't announce your good works with trumpets as if I'll look at me, look at me, it has nothing to do with what you just did. That's the kind of sharing that we desperately need. It's not bragging. You're simply saying, I saw a need. I was a CNA for many years, and I worked with the elderly. And uh, it's tough to see them going downhill. Yeah. It's tough. She doesn't have anybody. She doesn't have any family. Yeah. She has no one. Most of the people that she did know passed away in our uh, building. Beautiful. So she's kind of, you know, really by herself. I think what I want you to see, I'm 47 years old. I won't say how old you are, big, but you're older than that, right? You're in the upper stages of life. Do you really care about that generation? And, and so when I say, do I care, what I'm trying to get, I'm not trying to be crass. I hope you, you get that. I'm trying to display how inauthentic I and we are. We have a generation of 70 and 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds. Well, when's the last time you had a conversation with someone? That's how you know if you care. Because they have something to offer. If I don't think they have something to offer, I'll just continue on my way and let them die off. We let people die off all the time. Because you don't agree with me, I kill you off. We do this all the time. So back to that, this idea, don't let this thing about, um, you know, don't announce it with trumpets, hear us from sharing our stories. We have to share what we're doing for God because it encourages us. If I know that Ruth is making a difference in her neighborhood and with the people that she's caring for, then that makes me say, hey, you know what, I can do that too. And I'll prove it. this is why there's always competing truths in the scripture. Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. So why? So that they may see your good works and not pat you on the back and say, way to go, but so that they can give glory to your Father who's in heaven. When we share about what God is up to, when we share about what I am up to, all of a sudden it says, that other person is in the same boat you are. Do you know that? No one cares. Think about it. If you're a good person and you care a little bit, think about it. There's so many people walking around life just tunneled vision. They don't care. And so I have to pull up a chair next to them and start to engage in life with them. And then tell them, you know, the other day I went to this woman's house. She was 80 years old and I cooked a meal for her and we had the greatest time ever. And then that person goes, oh my gosh, grandma, I haven't talked to her in months. I love my grandma, but I haven't talked to her in months. You just became Christ to that person. You just made the world better. 
because you engaged in a conversation that mattered. Do you see it? Do you see it? Sharing is love. Love is sharing. So don't, please don't hold back. Anytime you have a story like that, please raise your hand and get the mic. I get tired of hearing myself speak sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, I, I need you to speak. I need you to stay. This is what's going on in my life. This is who I'm investing in. I'm taking a shot here, Sean. I'm trying. I'm trying to be in the game. And guess what? I messed up the other day, too. It's okay. That gap is filled with God's grace. There's no judgment, just like I said last week. The gap is big, but I can narrow the gap every single day with a choice to love the other. And then when there's this inauthenticity and a lack of integrity, it's okay. But the next day, show up. Show up. Because when you show up and then you share how you showed up, it blesses another person. So when we talk about Jesus, this morning we're going to continue on the Sermon on the Mount. Would anyone like to do the Bible reading this morning? I'm going to go quick, so raise your hand in the next three seconds. Hands up. Boom. Mic. Do you have the mic? And I'm going to let people sit for this one, so even though it says stand, we usually just, for, if you're new here, we usually stand and, and just allow the scriptures to be spoken, but I want us to just allow the word, just be reflective of this, okay? Go ahead. Matthew 6. Oh, by the way, this, this is from the message translation, so I, I wanted to kind of mess with you a little bit this morning, because the message translation says, these are very familiar verses, but now you're going to hear it maybe differently. Matthew 6, 19 through 34. Don't hoard treasures down here where it all gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place where you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your window, what a dark life you will have. You can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. If you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more to him than the birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much of a difference? Instead of looking at fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside of them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. Amen. So here are the topics. Money 
and worship, glory and worship, and then a life of worship. Okay? So we're going to go through that just for a second. But we're not going to talk about money in the sense of how you might have heard a talk about money before. I don't think that's the intent of the scripture. I think Jesus is using money to get people's attention, to give them a much deeper truth. And it's a truth about their heart and why they're here. What's the intention of how you live this life? And money, the love of money, usually gives us an indication of where our heart is. So I want to share with you, because I was, um, some of you know, I'm, I'm, I've been writing a book called Be Uncommon. It might change, but The Uncommon Life, something like that, you know. And it, this, this idea that when Jesus comes into our life, it's countercultural, right? We talk about the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus is coming there to like, boom, turn everything upside down. Everything you ever thought about me, or what you thought about this kingdom, boom, turn it upside down, okay? And so I was thinking about this, and I was talking about the uncommon life, and I started talking about finances this week. It was just, it was just a coincidence, God coincidence, I guess. Um, and I, as I was writing, though, the thing that came to me about finance and the uncommon life, we talked about a 10, 10, 80, 10, 10, 80 lifestyle. So give 10% away, uh, save 10%, live off the rest. All right? That would be very counterintuitive to probably even some of you in this room. To give away 10% of your money. That's, that's a big deal. You say that to people on the streets. But now, maybe Jesus is after something in this. Because now, how many people are stressing about money? How many marriages are falling apart because of money? And then you sit there and go, you know what? I've been practicing this thing called 10 10 80. And I've been practicing giving away 10% of my money to, to people in need and to care for others. And I got to tell you, I have financial freedom and peace. How many of your friends, how many of you, don't raise your hand, can say that? Jesus is going after this topic of money saying, is this your God? Are you finding your success and your prestige and your image in all of this thing called money? Is that what you're after? Because somehow you think worshiping and desiring and going after that is somehow going to produce the results that you're looking for. And Jesus is saying, actually, give it away. How about this? Give your life away. When you give your life away, what happens? You gain your life. Jesus in these scriptures is always about, are you truly living? Because most of us walk around like we're dying. There's a song, live like, I think, I don't even know the name, but it's like, live like you're dying. You know what I mean? That's a great thing to think about this morning. Live like you're dying. Because if you weren't promised, and I like to say, if you knew you were going to die in five years from now, what would change? If I said it was a month, you'd all do stupid things. You'd waste all your money and you'd go out and do these crazy things. But if I say five years, you might say, Oh my gosh, I've got five years to make an investment in this thing called life. i got five years to put, pick a people group that I want to invest in because I want to give them hope and I want them to know that their lives matter and I want them to know the love of Jesus Christ. And if I had five years, this is what I would do. And I don't think money would be on the table. I don't think we'd be chasing after. Money's important, don't get me wrong. And if you have the gift of making money and you're rich, good. God bless you. Use it to make a bigger difference. Okay, so it's not about rich or poor or any of that stuff. It's about what do you desire and what does it represent to you? And so I'm going to just ask you to take two minutes around your tables. And if you're not sitting with someone, sit with somebody. But ask yourself the question, what is it? What is your biggest challenge regarding the topic of money? Just take one minute. Two, like... Two minutes around your tables, all right? What's your biggest challenge around the topic of money? All right, give me one answer from this table over here. One, one answer. Just something. Go, say it. Learning to live on Social Security. Worrying about finances. Prioritizing. Just quick. One thing. All right, back there, one thing. What is it? Paying bills on time. What about over here? 
One thing. Good. Say it. The more you have, the more you're going to chase it. Accumulation. What? Savings. Avoidance. Avoiding dealing with the topic of money. All right. So Jesus is trying to say this. It's not about money. It's about worship. It's not about money. It's about worship. It's about freedom in Christ. Now listen, this idea of, oh, actually put up the reflection question because take a picture of this or write it down or whatever. But what's the reflection question? How does your relationship to money impact your relationship with Christ? You have, all of us have a relationship to money, okay? It doesn't matter to me what it is necessarily. All of us have a relationship to it. And we have a relationship to Christ. What does that look like together? Reflect on that during this week. Because now go into the scripture again. And it says in Matthew 6, 19 to 24. And this is the idea of money and worship. It says don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corroded by rust. Or worse, stolen by burglars. Listen, stockpile treasure in heaven. Where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The place where your treasure is. Think about it. Jesus is saying this should be obvious. The place, the place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Your eyes are a window into your body. If you open your eyes and one of the pull the blinds, loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. It begs this question. What is this treasure? Anyone know what the word treasure means in that? Biblically? Go ahead. Storing your treasures in heaven. But the word treasure there, because a lot of us might think somehow this has to do with other things. The word, go ahead. It's love, okay. Happiness, okay. Salvation. Salvation. What is it? Your personal gifts or talents. Here's what it means in the Greek. The place in which good and precious things are collected and laid up. It could be seen as a storehouse or a deposit. Think about that. A storehouse or a deposit. And now, two quick scriptures that we'll close with. It's about the good fruit and the good tree. These are two places where the word treasure is used. Just because I want you to get a feel for Jesus and his teachings. In Matthew 12, 35, it says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. That phrase right there is the word treasure. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Okay, now a very good example of this is the young rich ruler. A lot of us uh, know this story, but I want you to think about what's really the issue here. Okay, with this man who lived it all out. Luke 18 says, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, this, is, this guy said, I've done all of the commandments. He was a good Jew, okay? And then he says, you still, Jesus was sitting there, you still lack one thing. There's a gap. When I talk about loving each other, it's like, Cindy, you're doing great, and I love you, keep it up, but there's a gap. And when I see the gap in your life, I love you enough that we're going to address the gap. And I'm going to do it with care and no judgment, but we're going to sure this up because I need you. And I need you to be able to then pass it on to someone else. Jesus was always after bigger lives. You understand that? He wants you to have a bigger life. Because as you get this, then you'll pass it on to another. You can play small and make it about self. Or you can play big and make it about a community. You can make it about a society. You can make it about the world. You get to choose. So Jesus is looking at this young rich ruler and said, that's great, you follow all these commands, but what about this one thing? What about this one thing? You still lack it. Sell everything you have. And what? Give it to the poor. 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Oh my gosh. This is so rich. When I talk about the world being me and me being the world, do you get that there's a distribution of wealth problem? Do you get there's an us and them? And guess what? If you live in America, you are the rich. And you are the powerful. And you are the wealthy. And you are the young, rich ruler. And Jesus is saying, do you care about the poor? It's not even about money. It's about worship. Because if you love me, you'll lay your life down for me. And you'll care about what matters to me. And I care about the poor. Sell it all. And then come follow me. Jesus said to all the folks, it's just an invitation. Come and follow me. I want your life to be bigger. Expand your life. Expand my kingdom. Keep sharing. Keep loving. I'm going to close there. And I'm going to leave you with this last verse. In verse 34, it says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing when? Now. And don't get worked about what, about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Right now. When you live your life... We can't solve the world's problems. I'm not suggesting that. But I can go over David and Linda's house and have, I mean, Diane's house and have dinner together. <laughs> or at Panera. <laughs> right? We can engage in dialogue. And then together, we can raise them up. Because if I can enlarge them and enlarge their life and enlarge their marriage, maybe they'll do it with someone else. We're all connected You get it? It's not about money. It's not about worrying. It's about a life of worship. I say it's not about me. It all starts with that simple phrase. It's not about me. Die to self. Then you'll have life. Then you'll have life. Jesus. The rest of that verse ends as a prayer, and it says, steep your life in God reality. To live life closer and closer to the reality that God is present, that God is at work in our lives. And to steep our lives in God initiative, caring for others and seeing people the way that he and to steep our lives in God provision, knowing we don't have to worry because God has provided. God, show yourself to be our provider in such a powerful way that we can trust you, that we can lay it all down, give it all away. But as we give it all away, we gain you, we enlarge our lives, we bring your kingdom. So have your way in us. May your will be done. May you bring heaven to earth. Your kingdom come. Use us. Enlarge our heart. Enlarge our share. Enlarge our love. Let us do it in honor of you. Amen. Thanks for coming to church. Go and make a difference. The one life that you have. Thank you. For